Hi, very good morning, everyone. So today we are going to talk about RPLND. Okay, when we discuss the management of a non-seminomatous germ cell tumor in a testicular cancer, the discussion of RPLND becomes very important. There are various terminologies you will be coming across regarding the types of RPLND. Okay, so when you read the text, you will come across there is something called primary, there is something called post chemo, salvage, and all. So we will take up the definitions. Try to quickly understand what's distinct difference between the different types of RPLND. And uh, when you look at the uh, management of a non seminomatous germ cell tumor, if you know the management, then the different types of RPLND becomes more clear. So we start by looking at the management of a non seminomatous germ cell tumor. So mainly we consider RPLND for a clinical stage 2. For clinical stage 2 non seminomatous germ cell tumor, it means the patient has retroperitoneal lymph nodes, okay? And these are again classified into A, B, and C, depending on the size of the retroperitoneal lymph nodes. So if in a clinical stage 2 retroperitoneal lymph nodes, when they're present, you, the next thing that you look at is the serum tumor markers. So you look at the serum tumor markers in this patient because your management significantly depends or differs depending on the levels of the serum tumor markers. If your markers are elevated, in that case, you offer the patient first-line chemotherapy. The basic concept is you are expecting a systemic disease, you are expecting a micrometastasis, therefore you offer the patient a first-line chemotherapy, which is a BEP regimen, three cycles. If the markers are normal, in that case, you offer the patient RPLND. This type of RPLND that you are offering the patient in the first line of management is known as the primary RPLND. Okay. So, what is primary RPLND? The lymph node dissection that you're offering at the first line management when the markers are normal with the positive retroperitoneal lymph nodes in a CT scan. This is known as the primary RPLND. Suppose you start the patient on a first line chemotherapy because the markers were elevated. Now, after that, you do a follow-up. Definitely, you will get a follow-up after you have completed the three cycles of BP. You will do a CT scan to see for any residual mass. So you do a CT scan, and unfortunately, you find there is a residual mass. If the residual mass is significant in size, which in case of a non seminomatous tumor is considered to be more than one centimeter, if you find in the CT scan post chemo, there is a residual mass more than one centimeter, again, your concern is get a tumor marker. Again, you should get a tumor marker. This time also your purpose is to rule out because an elevated tumor marker would indicate a systemic disease, possibility of micrometastasis. So you should get a tumor marker done again. If the marker is elevated or marker is normal, there are two possibilities. So if you find that the marker is elevated again, so go for a second line chemotherapy. Okay. Second line chemotherapy, this could be EP4 cycles or that could be windblastin based therapy. So you offer the patient a second line chemotherapy. But if the markers are normal, there is a residual mass, you expect your metastasis restricted to the lymph nodes. In that case, you offer the patient another RPLND. And this RPLND that you offer the patient after the chemotherapy is known as the post chemo RPLND. The patient already received the first line chemotherapy. Okay, so if there is a mass which is residuing or which is persisting after the chemotherapy, it's most likely that the mass is not responding to chemotherapy. Either it is a teratoma or it is a necrosis. The most likely histology of a mass which is persisting after the first line chemotherapy is likely to be a teratoma or a necrosis because those are the things which don't respond to chemotherapy. Very little possibility is that, that this mass could be a viable malignancy, okay? It could be a viable malignancy also, but it's very little possibility, and that's only seen in about 15% of the patients you find it's a viable malignancy. If at all, you do a post-chemo RPLND and you find that the viable malignancy in the histology, this is a poor prognostic marker. That means the cancer remains even after the first line chemotherapy. That's a marker of a poor overall survival. And in that case, you have to consider offering the patient an adjuvant chemotherapy with the BP2 cycles. Okay, so there will be controversies here, but for your exam, please remember this. If there is a residual mass after a first line chemotherapy and the markers are normal, offer the patient PC RPLND, that is post chemo RPLND. Post chemo RPLND, it's most likely that it will be a teratoma or a necrosis. 
If at all it is a viable malignancy that indicates a poor prognostic marker and you offer the patient adjuvant cycle of 2B, B2 cycles, okay? This is important. Now, let's move forward. Suppose you again take up this patient. This time the patient again received the second line chemotherapy and you again follow up the patient so the cycle continues. You do a follow-up with a CT scan and again you do a CT scan, you find there is residual mass. This time again you get a serum tumor markers. There are two possibilities. The markers are normal or the markers are elevated. Now, if the markers remains elevated, even after two cycles of chemotherapy, two lines of chemotherapy, you offer the patient a third line chemotherapy in that case. So if the markers are elevated even after that, then the third option will be a third line chemotherapy. Usually these regimens are not very effective. And let's see what other alternatives we have. So if you offer the patient third line chemotherapy, it's on the scenario that the markers remain elevated along with the residual mass. But if it's time, you find that the markers are normal and there is a residual mass. In that case, you again offer the patient an RPLND, and this time the RPLND that you offer after two chemotherapy regimens is known as the salvage RPLND. Okay? What is salvage RPLND? Salvage RPLND is the one that you offer after a patient has received two lines of chemotherapy and the markers remain normal and the markers, the salvage RPLND has a poor outcome, okay? If a mass persists after two lines of chemotherapy that's not responding, then it's likely an overall survival and the progression is more than the previous RPLND, like a post-chemo RPLND. So the outcomes of a salvage RPLND is worse than a post-chemo RPLND. Now, there is another term which you need to understand, and that is known as the desperation RPLND. Okay, now what is desperation RPLND? If you offer, so a patient has received all chemotherapy regimens, still the markers remains elevated more than normal, either in the decreasing trend or still elevated. You don't have any other chemotherapy options and the next option that you have is to go for an RPLND. But this is only possible if the patient has a metastasis which is limited to particular lymph nodes, which can be removed surgically. If the patient has widespread lymph metastasis, in that case, you're not going to offer the patient a desperation RPLND. Okay? So I'll just quickly summarize this. This is a wonderful table that I have for you. Wonderful algorithm. So you see a patient with a non-seminomatous germ cell tumor, and this is mainly for clinical stage two, where the patient has a retroperitoneal lymph node. And if the patient has a marker elevated, the first you go for a first-line chemotherapy. And if the markers are normal, you prefer for a primary RPLND. Okay. Now, if you after a pulse line chemotherapy, if there is a residual mass, which is significant if it is more than one centimeter. And in that case, even if the markers are elevated, you offer the patient second line chemotherapy with the concept that there is a possibility of a systemic disease. And if the markers remains normal, in that case, you go for a post-chemo RPLND. As I said, the possibility of a viable malignancy in a post-chemo RPLND is very less. Okay, remember TNM, that is teratoma, necrosis, and a malignancy. The post-chemo RPLND has a very little possibility of a viable malignancy. It's most likely this the ones that did not respond to chemo are the ones like teratoma or a necrosis. Okay. Suppose the patient receives a second line chemo and there is a persistent residual mass after that. If there is an elevated markers, you go for a third line chemo. Markers are normal, you go for an RPLND and this time it's known as salvage RPLND. That is the last hope that you have. Okay. If the patient has no response even to a third line chemo or there is no options of any further chemotherapy left, the patient has elevated marker, but the metastasis is limited to particular sites. So the basic principle of a respiration RPLND is limited metastasis, which can be removed surgically. Then you offer the patient a desperation RPLND. Okay, you go for a desperation RPLND with the consent, with the approval that this has an inferior overall survival compared to the other treatment regimens, which is in the previous sections. Okay, so remember, this is the last option that we have with respiration RPLND, but it is only to be offered in an MDT setting and with the consent and with the CT imaging suggested that the metastasis is limited to the retroperitoneum to a lymph node and there is no widespread metastasis. When you read, you will also come across two or three more terms, okay? One of the term will be a reoperative RPLND. Now, suppose you have done a primary RPLND or any RPLND you are doing and you could not complete it because of some technical issues or because of patient issues. In that case, you go ahead for another RPLND in the same setting. 
So that's known as reoperative RPL and D. And sometimes it may happen there is an early relapse. In that case, you again go for a reoperative RPL and D. So reoperative RPL and D is mainly to treat something that has been left behind. Okay. Or mainly it's a relook kind of surgery. And there is another term known as RPL and D for a late relapse. Now, what we do in a late relapse is after two years, there is a possibility that there could be a recurrence in the retroperitoneum. And the most common recurrence that can happen is a York sac tumor. And the best first line treatment for this is recommended is an RPL and D. And this RPL and D is known as an RPL and D for late relapse. And the name itself is suggestive of. So hope you understand this different terminologies. When we discuss the RPL and Ds, there should be no confusion between primary, post chemo, salvage, and desperation RPL and D. And you should be clear about the reoperative and the relapse RPL and D. Okay, we will be discussing on the templates, on the complications in the class. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you so much for watching this.